you go to the healthiest, we love Florida. The Institute has been here now for 35 years. Like this. I want to congratulate you and thank you for doing this. Come on, for you. Yay. Yay. I remember one time going home uh, after eating at a girlfriend's house and describing a salad. And my mother said, yes, we just don't eat that here. <laughs> we're, we're proton. You have molecules, you have atoms, and you have protons and neutrons. Proteins come from the word proton. It comes from the sun. Where do you get most of them from? Green, leafy plants. What evolved on the planet Earth, period, this is not my opinion, we're giving you science now. What evolved on the planet Earth to capture every drop of life on this Earth is green, leafy plants. New disorders, HIV, which didn't exist, remember. Chronic fatigue syndrome, which if you're a youngster, 40 years old and younger, 35% of the population, young population, has chronic fatigue syndrome. You wonder why they're dysfunctional, they can't work, they can't talk straight? It's because they have a virus that's attacking their neurological system, starting in the brain. None of these things existed. And one by one, as we pointed out from all over the world, many, many times before this pandemic, most of the people at the Institute were not Americans. Americans are slowly catching up for this. We're slowly getting it. But there'd be times 80% of the Institute were Europeans. Because this has been more so a way of life. They didn't lose something that we've lost called common sense. How's it going on? We're just doing what you should be doing. Period. There's nothing special we do, except we do what your great-great-grandparents knew how to do without being told they had to do it. They basically wouldn't have done the kind of crazy things we do. You just look at the food that we eat, excuse me, quote, food that we eat. You just look at that one aspect, it's surprising to me any of us survive beyond 10 years old. That most of this has no nutrition, at all. It is latent with chemicals. Not only the pesticides, fungicides, and herbicides that you're noting all the time, but how about what I learned from Dr. David Kessler? Anyone know that name? Dr. David Kessler used to run a little organization called the Food and Drug Administration. He personally told me that every major food company globally, international food company, Lace your food with synthetic opiates. Let me repeat this again. They intentionally lace your food with synthetic opiates. Not bad enough they put sugar in your food that's significantly more addictive than heroin and cocaine. That wasn't quite enough. Now they put opiates in your food. And you say, where do you get them? I'll drive you up here two minutes onto that highway, and I'll show you store after store. All of the fast food places, all of the 7-Elevens, all of those places have opiate-riddled food. And when you start to look at what they've done intentionally and the end result, where we've crippled the economy of every major nation in the world, how many of you know in seven years, the economy in the United States, 25% will go towards healthcare, and we're the sickest nation in the West? Whenever you hear your asshole politicians around election day on either side tell you that they basically you know, love you so much that they want to take care of you. The fact of the matter is that they know that number. And if you're going to cripple an economy of a major country by the fact that people are that sick, wouldn't you think somebody with a little common sense would say, hey, we've got to do something to make our people healthy? Did you hear any major network during this two-year nonsense that we just went through, ever say healthy people aren't dying? I never heard CNN, Fox News, MNBC, no New York Times, LA, I've not seen one of them ever say that healthy people do not die from this virus. Now, don't you think that's the first thing they should say? Don't you think every doctor in the United States and everywhere in the world that was facing this pandemic wouldn't say that thing? If they were legitimate doctors who remember the oath they took that June, what's the name of that oath? Hippocratic oath. Hippocrates says, do no harm. So every time a doctor takes an oath, she or he vows to do no harm. And if nobody's talking, how many of you know the number of people, the statistical number 
globally now, two years into this thing, 82% of the people were overweight or seriously obese or obese. That's the number who died. So how come I'm telling you this, and that's not on major news networks? Mm -hmm. Money. They're in bed with Big Pharma. Right. Money. That's right. You got it. Yeah. Right. So and the meat and dairy. I'm here to say to you that by taking responsibility for your life, your diet is going to help not only you, but help all of us. If you don't have enough self-care and self-respect, at least you may want to do it for your children, your grandchildren. Because the reality is we're out of control. And I've never seen anything like this. Henry and I speak about this probably twice, three times a week. She, she was running Europe's most famous center. She won't tell you that for inflammation. Unlike here in North America where you have to fight for your life, they call us quacks. Mm -hmm. I'm not killing people at the rate and the level. I'm not killing anyone. I'm recovering, bringing people back. Can you imagine being the number three killer and still being respected? Mm -hmm. That's like saying Charles Manson's a great guy. Let's vote for him. <laughs> and the reality, quite simple, is we sit and sometimes cry. We have tears in our eyes. Because it used to be when I was dealing with ill people, they were my age. They were older. We've had a life. If one of us died, we can look back and say we've had 70, 80, 90 years of a life. But I'm dealing with babies. This week alone, last week I should say, an 11 year old, the cancer so bad the spine just collapsed, a baby with brain cancer, an eight year old girl with diabetic so bad that she's shaking constantly and having epileptic seizures. That was just this week, people. I never, ever, Heard that 40, 50 years ago. I would have thought it was a sick joke if somebody was talking to me or in front of me with these things. Today it's commonplace. If you look at one generation ago, if I'll remind you, a generation is 25 years. I was appalled 25 years ago when I read the data out of the New England Journal of Medicine that said our youth, 18 year old youth and below, 12% had chronic diseases. I remember saying to Ann and others, that's appalling that we've let more than 10% of our children have a chronic disease at this point. You know what the number is? 54% today, 25 years late. What's gonna happen? What's gonna happen with these kids? Who's gonna pay for them? I don't care how wealthy you are, at some point it breaks, the system. The system breaks, and that's where we are at this point. Autism. How many of you know in 1980, one out of 10,000 had autism? How many of you know who Dr. Senef is from MIT? How many of you know what MIT is? MIT is the most impressive science organization on the earth. Something Americans should be proud of, MIT. And she is a woman who actually reads the research and approves it before they let them publish it out of MIT. She came out of the closet six, seven years ago and basically said, do you realize why we have half the children born today with autism? Let me repeat what I've just said to you. So 50% of the children born today are on what we call the autistic spectrum. Up until seven, eight years ago, we used to call it Asperger's, highly functional autistic, you know, disastrously autistic. We don't say that anymore. How many of you have read the latest research? Dyslexia is autism. That's the first signs we had of it. Five generations ago, for the Industrial Revolution created that. How many of you know ADD is part of that at this point? And what do they do in America? They put your kids and grandkids on cocaine. Last time I looked, cocaine's illegal. But Ritalin is cocaine. And they shut your kids up in class. I guess I would have been put on that, because I always questioned the teacher when I didn't agree with it. Today, how they take care of that? They put, dope your kids up and sit them in class. How many of you are from Illinois? Illinois has a law that if the teacher determines the child needs Ritalin, they must be put on it. Not a nurse, not a doctor, but the teacher in the school. Why? To shut the kid up. And the, kid, the parents go along with it. We have a relative that put their daughter, who's totally dysfunctional in her mid-20s at this point, on Ritalin when she was eight years old. Totally dysfunctional. Now, I never took cocaine, but I can tell you something, and all of you know this story, it eats the cartilage out of your nose. 
What do you think it does to your brain? And that's a pharmaceutical drug. And that's part of the autistic spectrum. So Dr. Senoff clearly stated, and you can't deny the smartest woman probably in MIT, when she says, why 50% of us are now born with some level of autism, is number one high fructose corn syrup drinks. We didn't know that until she came out with her MIT research. We knew how bad they were, but we didn't know that. Yes, is vaccine part of it? Yeah, vaccine's part of it. But guess what? Laminated floors are part of it. Now, thank God we never had laminated floors in our home with our four kids when they were crawling around. But how many times did I let them crawl on the laminated floor? Probably many times. How many of you know, I didn't know until Senate did the work out of MIT, that that's causing brain damage. And all autism is is brain damage. And so when they come to us like this and we put them on the Hippocrates diet and lifestyle, many, many, many of these people reverse it or dramatically improve. Mm -hmm. He basically was saying that to me. It was hard for me to believe it at that point. Today the date is in. It's in. But it's also the number one way you destroy the immune system. You are your immune system. Why people die? Bad immunity. Why people don't die? Good immunity. End of story. Now what happens when you put a carcass of an animal into your body? Well, let me, I know this lovely lady wouldn't do it, but how about if she hit her head and got dumb and tomorrow went down and bought some free-range animal food? You know, that's bullshit too. I write books on this. That's all for white yuppies, by the way. No such thing as free-range anything. It's all in factory farms and all cruel and horrible. And, and what do you think, there's a, a pleasant way to kill an animal? No, there's one way to kill an animal. You can either talk to them and give them psychotherapy before you kill them, but they're gonna end up dead anyway. <laughs> the fact of the matter is, if she went out and got free-range animal food, chicken, and she said, I'm not going to put it in the refrigerator, what's it going to smell like in here in two days? Anyone want to render up what, what it would smell? How many of you would like to come and visit Connie if it was sitting here for three or four days? You'd gag when you came to the door. What do you think? It, it doesn't do the same thing in your body. It just does it at a much more rapid pace, I can tell you. It doesn't take days. It takes minutes, because you have enzymes in your body that start to break this up, and the putrefaction of milk from another species. No. We don't know why our kids have colic. Well, my God, you keep feeding them cow milk for a cow that's supposed to be 1,000 pounds. And no wonder they get colic. It's undigestible, curdling inside of their intestinal tract, creating bad bacteria. The chicken does, the fish does. The red meat does, the pork, even the Bible told you not to eat pork and shellfish. <laughs> that was 2,000 years ago. <laughs> what the hell did we have to be told again? And we've watched. When you take people off this nonsense, it's not human food, they fight the aging process, always, and they reverse and prevent disease, always. Not some of the time, not many. Just two days ago, one of my colleagues at Yale basically commented on it. They came out with a study out of Norway where they did something called a meta-study. You know what a meta-study is? They're the only ones I trust anymore. Because how studies are funded is somebody with deep pockets that has vested interest. Mm -hmm. So I fly up to Harvard to go to Stanford or Oxford or Cambridge or McGill, and I basically give a big check. Here's 15 million, 20 million bucks. Here's what I want you to prove. Mm -hmm. That's really how science works. You think there's legitimate science? By mistake, it may happen occasionally. Yeah. So what they now have had to do, because it's so corrupted at its core, science globally, that they take 10 studies, 20 studies, 30 studies, 40 studies, and they look at the commonality. You may literally have 100 studies that come up with different conclusions. Isn't that interesting? They looked at the same thing, 100 studies say something totally different. But in the 100 studies or the 10 studies, you actually see the thread of things they always discover. That's what we've now had legitimate scientists have to do now. And this group out of Norway basically concluded that if you dramatically reduce your animal-based foods, men live 13 years longer, women live 10 years. So my buddy, Dr. Katz out of Yale, in a very gentle way, because he's politically smart, he basically said, do you know if you got rid of all the animal food, the data would be a lot better. It wouldn't be 13 years and 10 years, it would be like 20 years and 30 years. 
That's what you'd see. This is what we see. We see it constantly. We're becoming decrepit because of how decrepit we are in the way we live. We're becoming ill because of what we consume, how we think, and the inactivity we have. Most people don't recognize everyone exercised dramatically 100 years ago. Today I exercise a lot. I'm probably a wussy compared to a man in 1850. I mean, really. They were out plowing fields 10 hours a day. What do I do? Go to the gym and lift weights three days a week? <laughs> That's it. It's nothing compared to it. Yeah. And the fact is we have a lot of changes to make. But it comes first and foremost to the food you chew. And let's look at the environment. If you don't recognize it. One of my favorite guys in the world is an MD dentist, Dr. Openland. Any of you that think it's perfectly fine to do what you did, I'm going to give you a knife. I'm going to take you out in the field out here a little bit east of us. And go and get your meal. Go get your meal. I don't think many of you would do it. That's for sure. Number two is what? Biological. How many of you enjoy being sick with arthritis, diabetes, heart disease? How many of you enjoy spending half your life at a doctor? No way. And when the doctor gives you the wrong information, you go to another doctor who gives you wrong information. They give you another drug, another drug. Before no, Nobody ever asks what other drugs you're on. Mm -hmm. And you may be one of the data statistics that make them number three killers now in the United States. What's the next one? Psychological. It is very clear to us that not eating plant-based diets, you destroy the serotonin uptake into the brain, 90% of what we call happy juice. Why people are depressed? Listen closely. There's a chemical reason. It's called serotonin. 90% of that comes from the intestinal tract. And by the way, the intestinal tract is not high in probiotics and high in prebiotics. What are prebiotics? Dark leafy greens. You got it. Cellulose. It's, you're not going to have happy juice. You're not going to have there. So you're going to be depressed. And if it's bad enough, you're going to be bipolar, schizophrenic. We see some of these things reverse, people. I don't come here to tell stories. I come here to tell you the story. I don't have to make any of this stuff up. We watch it in our work on a daily basis. What's the next one I told you? Yeah. And look at that. The spiritual and the environmental effect of this. If you don't care for yourself, and a lot of people don't care for themselves, that's why everyone gets psychotherapy at the Institute. Basically, Recognize that this, by the way, is hurting people. Your habits, your lifestyle hurts other people as much as it hurts you. And the spiritual one is important. But the last one is what again? Sexy. You want to be sexy? sexy. That's it. That's right. <laughs> All right, that's it. Give yourself a hand. Wow. <laughs> the place you naturally get nutrition and oxygen is raw plant-based food. Once you cook the food, the fragrance coming out of the food is the oxygen. So breathe heavy over the pot. <laughs> That's the only way you're going to get oxygen. Number three, and the most important, this is a new guy on the block. We didn't know about this until the 80s and really the 90s. So people would ask, so I joined the team in 1975 in Boston. They sent me to Europe. I spent three and a half years in Europe opening centers, bringing this message back, etc., and uh, learned a lot. I brought a lot of the European traditions back with me, and, and the most important thing, my wife is smarter than me. <laughs> that happened. But what really occurred is in 1980, they asked me to be the director. Now, I didn't know what the director was, but I had enough ambition to say yes. I've been trying to figure it out ever since. But the truth is, I wanted to know why this worked. And if I asked the people who were leaders at that point, every day they would have a different reason. So we didn't know. In the 1990s, they started to do work at places like Johns Hopkins, Stanford University, UCLA, Oregon State University, Linus Pauling Institute, and they said there is an extraordinary chemistry within raw plant-based foods that is actually there and programmed in for hundreds of billions of years. Let me repeat this. Plants have been around on this earth hundreds of millions of years. You've been around in this form for about 11,000 years. Homo sapiens, the way we sort of look, 11,000 years. Now think about this. These plants had toads in them to reverse and prevent disease. And we didn't know this when Ann Wigmore in 1956 decided to start putting sprouts into the diet. Can you imagine? You don't even know what a damn sprout is. In the 1950s, she's saying, eat sprouts. <laughs> and 
They didn't know what a vegetable was in 1956. And now we recognize the food with the most phytochemicals in it, medicines in it, are sprouts. So when I finally grasped this thing in the early 80s, I said, wow, this is like stunning. I write books on this for doctors now, for scientists. And the fact of the matter is, that has something called sulforaphane in it that just three days ago, they showed that what is called long COVID, which is damage from the virus, mm -hmm. literally is reversed from sulforaphane, which also reverses and prevents cancer from broccoli sprouts. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, the foggy brain people had after the virus or the vaccine, mm -hmm. it's actually reversing that. That's the latest science three days ago that came out. Mm -hmm. But it also reverses cancer, ulcers within the intestinal tract, and by the way, sulfur helps osteoporosis and osteopenia. Sulfur. sulfur. That's in the broccoli sprouts? Exactly. Yeah. Broccoli sprouts, onion sprouts, garlic sprouts. But again, if you're not weightlifting love, you gotta do all of this together. And by the way, you know, it's fun to do weightlift. You get a, a stud puppy to train you. <laughs> if you cook a food kaput, they're gone. 115 degrees and above, they're gone. And remember, hormones are the language of the, the cells. You know, oxygen is how cells uh, absorb nutrition. Phytochemicals are the medicine in the food. And enzymes are the food for your electric body. So we all have electric bodies. That's why we have two and a half million dollars worth of electromagnetic equipment at Hippocrates. So we have an energy medicine. you to believe it. Is you come to a doctor, you come to an institute, we cure you. That's, not, that's why it doesn't work. So what we do is we come to the Hippocrates, we do incredibly interesting scans on you. There was no such thing as allopathic medicine. So medical doctors in the 19th century, 1800s, actually thought it was evil spirits that were making people sick. This is a fact, by the way. So if you went to a doctor in 1875, he most, because it was never women, although women were the real healers, and we'll get to that in a minute, uh, basically, <laughs> they would actually think there was some evil thing that was happening to you. Now, there was a guy called Pasteur in Litz. Pasteur was in Paris, and Litz was in Scotland. That basically said, no, you're crazy. The Dutch figured out there's this unit called a microscope that you look at people who are sick, and there are these germs running around. And they came up with a germ theory. Now, that was in the 19th century. This guy called Rockefeller. Any of you hear about him? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Rockefeller went to Ottawa and went to Washington and went to Paris and went to London and said, we're the, we're the guys who know how to remedy health problems. We want to control health problems. And there was enough integrity in politics then, not today, Lydia. They said, you can't do that. It's an inherent right of people to choose their health destiny. You can't take it over. So a little bird landed on Rockefeller's shoulder and basically said, but if you patent herbs, if you patent herbs, because all there was is herbal medicine. There were two kinds of medicines in the history of humanity. Herbal medicine and herbal medicine and homeopathic medicine. There was no other medicine. So he started to patent natural medicine and took control within one decade. It was pretty much between the 1920 and 1930 period, and got rid of everyone by calling it folk medicine. You ever hear that term, folk medicine? Mm -hmm. That was a Rockefeller and Madison Avenue. But he, was patent, so, he was patenting chemicals in the oil. That's, the that's the exactly oil right. Oils. Carnegie was brought, part of it. They brought out the Flexner Report in 1910, which manipulated the training standards for medical edu education going forward. That's exactly and right. It was a Gates, believe it or not. That's a very little known fact. I just discovered it. He was a few part of it. Ago. He was one of the three. There were two Flexner Blood Brothers, and there was a Gates, and he had to be related to the asshole that we Yeah, have I agree with you. So, what she's doing is Carnegie was also in cahoots with him. Remember, these were the people who controlled America. These were the people that can, not only the railroad, industry, economy, they were, the, they were working with the Rothschilds. And that's who they were working with. And the reality is by 1920, 1930, they took it over, pulled everything anyone else did, folk medicine, and made you have a picture that everyone's grandmother didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And got doctors, men, 
in white coats with stethoscopes in big shiny buildings and basically said, these are the smart people. And if you go to medical school, allopathic medical school in Russia, China, or the United States, they have the same curriculum. It's a global system of deception. And by the way, have you noticed lately doctors are looking up what they should do on a computer? Because what's happened since the 1970s is since 1970s, doctors cannot determine what they want to do on their own anymore. By the 1980s, what happened is that doctors have to follow something called standard of practice. And I have a good friend, Dr. Cooperman, who's a vegan. He's 86, 87. You ought to see this guy. Amazing character. He's still dating. <laughs> so who do you go out with? So I've got to go out with young women in their 60s. <laughs> That's <laughs> That's great. When he was at Cleveland Clinic, he basically figured out with a group of guys up there that lumpectomy saved a lot more lives than mastectomies. And they published it, and it was completely accepted by the scientific community. But what happened is lawyers got involved, and lawyers would go in for the people who would occasionally die from this and say, by the way, they're doing this new practice where they only take out the lump, and Mary would have been perfectly fine if they took off the entire breast. So it can push that entire thing back again. So women have been consistently maimed and had breasts taken off when lumpectomies, by the way, were showing a 40% higher success rate and less mortality. That. This is the way the thing works. It's outrageous. It is. So doctors basically are controlled since the 1970s to look at a particular thing on a computer. What can I say? What can I? Our youngest son, our surprise baby, is in the top medical school in Europe as we speak. He's at Karl Linska, top researcher medical school in Europe. And basically we say to him, just bite your tongue, sit in the back. He's just right recently going through the pharmaceutical stuff. He said, it's good you know that. Take, we have to look this stuff up, and basically it's overwhelming, because there's new drugs every week. Once a drug fails, once a drug maims enough people, mm -hmm. then they pull it off, and they, they don't really change the drug, they just change the name of the drug mm -hmm. at that point. So this is a scary world that you live in, and this is why you're in a situation you are today, and why it's 25% of the economy soon, and why it's a number three killer, because everyone's out of control, and nobody's taking responsibility for their diet, the way they think, the way they live, your relationships. You know, people hate their jobs, they hate their partners. People are just in discombobulated states at this point. Okay. Any other questions? Eight million known species. There's maybe 12 million known species, uh, unknown species. 100% of those species in nature eat 100% raw diet. Mm -hmm. Now the only species that choose to cook food is Homo sapiens. Now, do you think 8 or 12 billion or a billion are wrong, or do you think we're wrong? Mm -hmm. So don't let me doubt. We're the science organization for 66 years that got the sickest people in the world. After medicine works them over and screws them for money, mm -hmm. then they come to us. Mm -hmm. And thousands have become, I mean, we're ripening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what's yeah. Yeah. What ripening means is the veins, the mother's veins, go down to the earth, they pick up the minerals, Ionically, they're not even actually picking up the minerals. They're the codes of the blueprint of the mineral. It comes up through the sap of the tree and out to the end of the plant, be it the stem or the bush or whatever it may be, and the baby is drinking like from the mother's breast. So the, the vine or the, the tree is actually the mother. The baby is drinking the mother. Now, this is amazing about nature. The nipple dries up. So once that plant, that fruit I should say, has enough nutrition in it, it gets heavy. There's enough enzymes and there's enough water in there. Now the nipple dries up and the wind comes and it falls to the ground. That's when you're supposed to be having the fruit. How many of you realize here in Florida our juice oranges really do not ripen until April? They start harvesting them October 1st. So every, pretty much every bit of orange juice you've ever consumed in your in your life, rob the body, I'll even say the word rape, rape and rob the body of nutrition. You ever notice what it does to your teeth? You give an arthritic orange juice, they're going to have joint pains. You would be a disaster, fruit, a disaster for you. And where do you get ripened fruit? Not in the store. They cannot and will not intentionally pick fruit ripe and ship it. 
How can they? If I were in California shipping you fruit, by the time it came here, you'd open up, the box would be rotten. So all unripened fruit, rob the bones, rob the teeth, rob the cells, take the sheathing off, the phosphorus sheathing off the neurological system. These aren't opinions, these are factual statements. Now, there is one fruit that doesn't, and this is because of our primates. Guess what that is? Bananas. Banana is the only fruit, there is a point where it's premature, but it has to be pretty small. But even a moderate size banana has enough enzymes in the skin. And the pecking order, who's that wonderful lady, the English woman who studied the apes, the chimpanzees? Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall. She was the first one that, ever, not long ago, she said to us, How, what happens is they have a pecking order, just like our communities. There's the, the top woman, the top guy, the one that's out of favor that day. And the one that was out of favor when these chimpanzees and monkeys start to walk, they make him or her drag the stalk of green bananas behind them. So they actually carry the food with them. And if you notice anything about bananas growing, one may ripen today, one tomorrow, one next week. They don't ripen all at the same time. So it's an amazing thing that not only does the fruit evolve for the evolution stage of fruit, but it evolved for the animal that was consuming it too. The symbiosis of that. It's just really amazing when you start to see this. Thing. So all fruit that's on ripen is dangerous to consume. That's, to me, just as bad as a high sugar content. Now, I had to learn this thought, and you don't see this anywhere in medical literature. As a matter of fact, they're just trying to get you to eat fruit and vegetables. Mm -hmm. So the big kumbaya story is eat fruit and vegetables, eat fruit and vegetables. I got so frustrated when I started to see that women's cancers, visible cancers, were growing when they would take fruit juice and fruit. This is 40 years ago. And this was frustrating me because my diet in great part was fruit at that point. Why not? Because I'm a sugar addict, just like everyone. I'm just a recovering sugar, sugar addict now. Just don't do it. And the fact is that I was on a plane and by good luck sit next to a guy who wanted to talk. I didn't want to talk. I'm reading and writing. And he happened to be an agricultural scientist. His expertise was fruit from the University of California. And in an hour and a half, he taught me more than three years of looking at books at major universities where I couldn't find a thing. And he said to me, the Chinese thousands of years ago started to hybrid fruit to have a higher sugar content. Not because they were bad people. They recognized what we recognize today. The guy at the market that sells the sweetest fruit sells it the best and the quickest. If you have sour fruit, you ever see anywhere where it says, enjoy sour fruit? <laughs> what do they always say? <laughs> they, we are programmed to want sweet. Remember, you need glucose to fuel not the only thing, you need a lot of things, but glucose needs to fuel the energy of your cell. So we are programmed for that. But the problem is, we're also programmed for addiction. So we don't stop, we don't have an off button. And this is a problem with fruit. It really is a problem with fruit. And nobody even addresses this issue. And what it does to, you talk to any legitimate dentist, a biological dentist, she or he's gonna tell you, we have one that works with us, the worst thing in the world is fruit, and the worst of the worst is dried fruit. That just sticks to your teeth and puts pits into it. Now, now let me preface this. If you have healthy young children, and they're getting ripe fruit, they can eat 30 40% of their diet as fruit. You, the healthiest one among us, no more than 15% when you're healthy. And if you have cancers, viruses, mold, yeast, fungus, bacteria, you don't eat fruit. Fruit hasn't been part of the diet for any sick person I've worked with since 1985. It is a weight off the diet. 